Wow. Hi, friends. My name is Jeremy. This is Red Means Recording. I've had three espressos, and in front of me is the live rig that I have uh, been working with for a bit. Did a video on it with the uh, Tapo graphic delay and the stereo triggered sampler, and today I'm here to tell you more about how it's working. Last night I recorded my performance for the Seattle Modular Nights live streaming, and I will be using this again for the... Um, New York Modular Nights live thing uh, coming up. So check links in the description for all that jazz. I want to focus on um, how I'm sequencing this and how I'm performing this because sound sources are sound sources, but um, it's the way that you interact with the rig and the way that you are able to change it and, and make you know progressions on the fly that I think is really the fun thing about what's going on here. And it took a fair amount of work. So we're going to start on the left side and move our way through and just kind of describe what's going on here. The first thing I need to do is press play. So you're going to hear a number of things. Let me uh, rock you through the sound sources. Bass is coming from the STO. It's going into the awesome ADSR VCA, which is providing an envelope and a VCA. And the envelope signal for that is going into the frequency modulation of the wonderful Happy Nerding, these, uh, Happy Nerding filter right here. So I'm using the envelope generator by here to change what's going on with the filter, which is really great. And I can control the amount with this big knob right here. This friend right here, the uh, LIP, is uh, a very complex digital voice that's doing a lot of stuff. We'll get back to it in a bit. Here's my mixer. Uh, the phones out of this mixer is going into the Happy Nerding FX Aid, and uh, it's a big ass reverb. So when I do this, I send to the reverb, which is a really wonderful performance tool. Tapographic delay is making the BIA do fun stuff. And uh, Plonk is doing my hi-hat. Uh, the 2HP play here is doing that little sampled knock. And I have some other choices. Little claps, stuff like that. This is Peaks, an after later audio uh, peak clone, and we're getting our kick. And there is a 808 snare that I can bring in there as well. I'm gonna change up my snare. The 4MS Stereo Triggered Sampler here is doing um, a lot of different things. Uh, I mean, it's triggering samples, but we have everything from cool drums to cool little uh, glitches over here. I have multiple IntelliGel triads hanging out, and we're going to talk about what those are doing in a bit. I've actually already covered what they're doing with this, um, but we'll get to it in a bit later. You've already heard that by turning that up, I got a different reaction out of this, which is really cool. So let's talk about sequencing. The first brain of this setup uh, is Pamela's new workout number one right here. Pamela's new workout is a device that can send out timed events, uh, either gate signals or clock signals, um, or modulation, including uh, randomized values. The gates that come out of this can be used to trigger things like envelopes, uh, filters, um, drums, all kinds of things, and they can also be used as clocks. There's a lot of blinking going on down here, and that's because mostly of what's coming out of this PAMS right here is clock signals. These two are feeding Renee, which is a sequencer that has three outputs, three pitch outputs and three gate outputs. I'm using one pitch output of Renee going into the IntelliGel Shifty, which is in SR mode, meaning that it's sending out the same signal to everything. I'm basically running these pitch outputs to multiple things here, and um, they're all responding to the root pitch that I'm going to uh, change here. So my baseline will change. I can transpose Arpitect over here if I want to. Um, it's, uh, it's a cool way of sending pitches out to multiple things. And then those things are getting their own individual gate signals. I'm going to turn this random up a bit. A bit more of a sparse signal there. We're going to talk about what's happening over here in a bit. This second Pamela's new workout is sending out gate signals and modulation signals to uh, other places in the rack, including feeding the tapographic delay its pings um, and feeding the uh, velocity input a uh, sine wave to get different uh, velocity levels. On that, 
which is a, a fun way to get pings in and out of the tachographic delay. There are two gate signals coming out of this that are feeding our sampler here. And we're going to talk about what is happening over here, because this is really the key, what's happening with these uh, CV inputs into PAMs. To the right of this, we have Steppy, a simple gate sequencer. This is doing our drums. And it's a pretty easy way to uh, get performative drum stuff where I can uh, mute channels, including the BIA. And then get in and make changes to my drum patterns on the fly, which is very useful. The snare signal is that you hear that little knock on is being molted out to both of these things, uh, the snare and the play, and I can bring the different textures in as I want which is a useful energy changer. To the right of that is Triad and Arpitect from WMD. Very, 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 very important in here. The uh, Arpitect is being sent into the uh, LIP. And there's a lot of controls on the Arpitect that you can play with in real time, including the overall scale, the number of notes in the ARP. So let's go ahead and increase this. You can see the notes that are being selected here. I can change those, which is a really, really fun way to get different progressions out of this. I can change the scale. Right now we're in a basic minor scale, but if I want to go to major, I can change it here. And the cool thing about Arpitect and Triad is that Triad is sending out to the Chainsaw Polyphonic Oscillator. So when I change the scale over here, I get a chord into Chainsaw that's appropriate. And I can change the shaping of that triad. I'm gonna go really big. It's just a beautiful polyphonic texture on top and I can change this independently of anything else going on there. So really cool way to introduce polyphony into your rack while getting a relationship with uh, another line. All of these little like sort of like one knob controls that can do a whole lot. So let's talk about the crux of the sequencing here. I've already mentioned that Pamela's new workout is sending out events that cause things to occur in this, including clock events, clocking the uh, architect, which in turn has an effect on triad, uh, clocking our samplers here, and um, clocking Renee, which is sending out um, pitch data and gate data. The uh, base over here, the envelope for the base is being triggered by the gate page on Y, which is the second sequencer page. So what's happening here is I've set up PAMs to receive two CV inputs, and I've set clocks in both of these. There's actually two sets of controls here. This is the first PAMs on the left, and that's the second PAMs on the right. When I turn up this first knob, I introduce to the clocks what's called the R skip parameter. The R skip parameter is a chance that the gate signal or the signal that is being uh, manipulated will not occur. So you're increasing uh, the probability that an event won't occur and you're decreasing the density of events in your rack. So you can go from lots of stuff happening to much less stuff happening. And originally I had all my clocks coming off the first PAMs, but I decided to split the sampler clocks off into a second one so that I could control the density of events of the sampler differently than the rest of the stuff. The second thing here 
is controlling the density of Euclidean events. Euclidean patterns are created by deciding the number of steps an entire pattern can be, and then deciding how many events fill in those steps. So I have, I think, all of these set to a 32-step possible pattern, and then I have different voltage offsets that will occur as I increase this to increase the number of possible events that will fill that up. So I'm getting rhythms. Let's see if we can make this really obvious. Those two bass sounds you hear are now coming from the uh, STS. So in full down mode, I'm getting um, a step amount, a possible amount for my Euclidean rhythm of 32, and a divisor of two, I believe. So I end up getting kind of like eighth notes. As I increase this, the complexity of these will change because I'm increasing the number of possible steps that will uh, occur within that Euclidean rhythm. And then all the way up, it's basically 16th notes. There's a few skips here and there, but not a ton. And the same thing is happening for uh, the ones that feed Renee and the rest of my system. So but the combination of skip and Euclidean with these controls here give me a, an immense amount of control over the density and energy of my uh, overall composition, which is really the key to this whole thing. I can get wild and then I can just toss these faders these R skip faders up and everything chills out, which is really, really nice. So I hadn't really experimented that much with uh, the inputs to PAMs in that respect. And now it's kind of my favorite thing because it really opens up a ton of a uh, ton of possibilities. And you notice I'm using stages for this. Originally, I bought a bunch of triads because I was going to use those. And then I was like, well, I got to branch out into this third fucking case here. So what am I going to do? Um, and then I was like, wait a second. I know that stages has a mode that basically just sends out voltages per channel. So I get a uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six channel. Uh, continuous voltage uh, offset generator here, which is really cool. Uh, triad still works great for it, but um, I'm using Triad for some other things. So why don't we talk about that now? Triad here, um, if you send a signal into it, will uh, basically attenuate it, and I can turn it up and down. So um, there's two things that it's doing. Uh, the first one is that it's feeding um, the sample CV input of our sampler here. So let's go ahead and turn up the length of these and change them back to uh, something different. How about, this might be a little annoying, but we'll try it out. Okay, so I have a, a banks of 10 samples. Each uh, bank contains 10 samples, and I can scroll through them like this. But what I have is Maestro here sending out on channels one and two a signal to step through in a rhythmic way the samples in the bank. So as I turn up Triad here, I'm gonna get a variety of samples played back based on the modulation that Maestro is sending in. Which allows me to create really cool, complex sample chains. Depending on how much I turn this up, I get different variations on that. So that's really, really, really fun. have an errant one volt per octave here coming off channel two and if I plug that into this I will get pitched events so let's talk about let's talk about Renee's role over here like I already said earlier Renee is sending out uh, my main pitch voltage and I have it done in such a way where I can change multiple pitches all at once 
Uh, so let's go to X's quantize page here. Right now we're on a C. So we're going to hear this in the bass. We'll talk about what I'm doing with Y in a second. Okay, so before we get into pitching, um, those clocks coming out of here uh, are going into feeding the sequence. So you, this, this way that it moves through its steps is dictated by um, clock signals. So if I space this out, you'll see these move a lot less because I have uh, you know, turned down the probability of a clock going to Renee. So it, uh, if I have a sequence on this, like this, uh, it will basically stop it. So one of the big things I do here is when I have a sequence set up up here, so let's go ahead and get something set up. So it's cool, very groovy, right? The bass line's super, super groovy. One of the fun things is having sequences like chords and this arp over here, and then changing the tonic note. really, really important in this rig is the concept of repetition. So if I just send clocks into this and into Arpitect, um, depending on how they're set up, they'll just continually go through a pattern. And sometimes they'll get sort of like off. They'll get off in terms of a timing. And I want to be able to um, constrain that so I feel like I have a repeating pattern. So you can send a, a little gate signal into the X mod and Y mod of Renee here and tell it to reset. And what I'm using, this is super over-engineered, but what I'm using is I'm using that this is not Rocket Science Tuesday's tick, beat, and loop out to um, create the possibility of a long or short phrase. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to turn up the uh, amount of quantization. So like we're going to get more octaves out of our bass. If I press this beats button here, I can switch between four beats, eight beats, 16 beats, and 32 beats. So what that means is, depending on how I have this set, I will reset Renee's uh, position in the sequence for 8, 16, or 32 beats. Right now we're in the longest, so I get a long phrase where this thing is kind of going all wacky. And if I was to change the snake mode on this to something a little stranger, it would seem cool but kind of chaotic. Now try to listen to what happens when I switch this back to four. We're gonna and watch the LED here. We're gonna see it reset every single time. Reset. 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 As opposed to every 32 bars it resets. So I can increase and decrease the overall time complexity of my, uh, the phrase complexity, the duration phrase complexity of my sequence, which um, was a, a kind of a revelatory thing. I really, really enjoyed introducing that because I can go to these tight techno patterns like this, um, or I can spread a little bit, like if I was going to go long on stuff. By the way, I have the same control over Arpitect right here with PAMS. I have a reset signal coming out. I can tell PAMS to reset Arpitect's position in the ARP um, at any divisor I want. So if I was going to go up in my, for instance, my amount of notes here, this is going to get kind of crazy. shall we? Alright, 
So listen to what happens when I change this. Shorter. See how it stopped going up? So again, complexity control. How can I lock a groove down? You can see that I have control over a range here. I can make this only hang out in a particular range. So it's going to loop every single time that it hits the top of that range and I'll get a different vibe from it. So complexity control. Complexity control via here. Complexity control via here. Complexity control via here. The rhythm knob is a complexity control thins out my sequence, which you can hear reacts differently when I have the envelope changed up here. So now that we have our focus on the lip, let me tell you what these other two triad knobs here are doing. I have uh, modulation coming from Maestro into these and being fed into the, f uh, looks like the fold and mod input of Lip. Uh, this is a really complex digital oscillator that can really metamorphosize into some really awesome digital tones, depending on how you have it set up. There's a billion sweet spots in it, um, and it sounds really wicked when you modulate it. So I can dial in modulation over here, and again, use Triad. to increase and decrease rhythmic modulation to it. Because I'm feeding Maestro, <laughs> Maestro, because I'm feeding Maestro um, swung clock, swung 16th notes, the, uh, the modulation is swung too. So that's really, really cool. And by the way, if you don't know how to get swing at 16th notes in PAMS, each parameter, uh, if you go in and go to the uh, delay thing, you can change delay, divide by two, and then increase the percentage and you'll get swing, which is that sort of galloping feel that this, this set has. about what Y is doing on here. So again, there's <laughs> three three different um, sequencers on here. There's X, Y, and the Cartesian one. X and Y can be clocked independently, and depending on what snake mode they're in, they'll move through the sequencer differently. You can see that we're kind of like going just up. Snake modes will uh, change that, um, and it's one of my favorite things. It's just really, really easy to uh, change the way that the performance is um, uh, happening, depending on what you have coming out of here. So what do I have coming out of here? All right, first up is the uh, the gates. The gates are being fed into the trigger for the VCA up here, which is triggering whether or not our base envelope occurs, and also, you know, conversely, not conversely, what the fuck am I talking about, uh, also feeds the um, envelope for our filter here. So a lot of power there. You can turn off whether or not a gate occurs on Rene. So now... I'm only going to get a envelope and filter event when it passes through that one little thing there. So I can increase and decrease the complexity of my gate signals. Now the bass is always getting pitch information, but it will only make the bass sound when it receives a gate. So when you thin out your gates here, you're going to get a bit of an interesting, uh, you know, effect. And of course, that is also dictated by whether or not I R skip or not. It's also dictated by whether or not we're getting that reset from over here. So lots to play with. 
the pitched CV of um, of this, the quantized pitch value, is being fed into the BIA here. So when I make this a bit more obvious, you can hear that I'm able to send a separate pitch sequence to BIA and give it a bit more uh, place in the mix. I can turn it into a lead voice, which is really, really cool. So if I go to my third channel of, or excuse me, my fourth channel of Steppy here and increase the number of gates, we'll hear that this pitch sequence is being sent over there. Noise engineering oscillators that I have in here are just astoundingly uh, digital, but also really expressive. There's a lot of really awesome places for them to be in the mix. You can get really awesome digital textures. Another topology control I have here is the decay of Planck. Whew. All right, should we do a recap? Uh, I guess there's a few more things. Um, this is a new addition to the case, this Modbat Performer. Um, it's a, I'll be talking about it more uh, in the future, but let's go ahead and switch this to a different patch. All right, well, there's a little sample base patch. So the Modbat is a four channel um, effects unit excuse me, a four effects unit uh, thing that it's meant to be played. So it's a really, really fun way to get in there and add In some cases, lock by holding shift, things like reverb. And delay. There's some other stuff going on here. I have it clocked. Here's a compressor built in, which is really, really nice. And you can actually side change the compressor, which is really cool. And then you have some color options. So you can actually sort of degrade this or make it sound like tape, which is also really, really nice. So one of, one of the things that uh, I've had fun doing is when I need to make a transition, I can come over here and do that. And when I let go, I've got a new thing. I'm going to be trying this out with some other configurations that I have, uh, other stuff that I have access to, um, but it, I just thought it would be a fun thing to throw into here, and indeed it... It, indeed it was. <laughs> I, I think that's pretty much it. Um, let's do a recap. Pamela's new workout is my main sequencer here, and it's it's sending out timing gates to things like my chainsaw and the bass, and it's timing my arpeggiator, and it's triggering my sampler, and I can change its skip probability or speed over here. So I can move from complex to not complex events. I have control over the duration of my phrases using the reset input of this and changing the beats amount over here. So let's go back to four. Coming out of Renee, I have pitch. 
that is going into things like my baseline. And also, depending on if I want it, I can, uh, where'd my cable go? Here it is. I can plug it into this and get pitched events over here as well. I've really been enjoying this sort of floating cable idea where I can just sort of like, you know, put something into something if I want to, uh, to change up my topology. I know there's probably modules that do that, but my solution has just been a floating cable. My drums are sequenced by Steppy, and that includes Peaks doing kick and a snare. Plonk is doing my hi-hat. 2HP Play is doing little percussive hits, as you can hear. Drum mixer. I'm pulling a tap off the drum mixer that's going into my audio interface. BIA is doing all kinds of fun little voice things. BIA is going into the 4MS Tapographic Delay, which gives me fun control over space. Effectsaid is doing a big-ass reverb that I am using the out phone's output, the headphone's output of this mixer, to be able to send to. Architect and Chainsaw are getting clock data from PAMs that I can thin out, and this is being sent to the LIP and to the Chainsaw, which is going to the Qubit filter. Which has a bit crusher on it, which is actually really, really nice. So I can change the vibe of my top polyphonic signal. I can also change the complexity and slide an amount of notes. architect to play the LIP. I can increase and decrease the amount of modulation coming from Maestro into LIP. And if I want to get weird, I can have LIP modulate itself because uh, it's really cool. Is this too much to uh, take on as one person? Almost. <laughs> um, it's still very, very difficult to do um, large scale events all at once, meaning uh, those kind of big changes that we expect from um, dance music. And I think if you ever try to do something like this, you'll quickly realize why a lot of live techno and a lot of live house and live electronic music sounds the way it does if people are actually playing live as opposed to just triggering loops. Um, in that you only got two hands and yes, you can create events that do a lot of things at once. But you only got two hands, so uh, you'll still need to really think about those changes. And I think that's the next step for me, is when I want to make a change to my uh, setup here, I want to change two big things at once. So I can change that, I can change my pitches, I could mute my drums and change the amount of events happening. I could mute my drums and change... Well, oh, excuse me, I could do... Something like that.
but yeah, I mean, it, there's going to be moments where, like, you're like, oh shit, I really wish I could have done more. Uh, scrolling through banks on here can sometimes trip me up. I got to work on that a bit. Um, but that said, it's been really, really fun. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope this has brought some insight into a possibility that you could uh, tackle something like this with. Yes, it's a lot of gear, obviously, um, but really it's about those, you know, thinking about where you can, like, set up a macro control to uh, affect a lot of stuff in your system at once. And things like stages and uh, triat and pams um, allow for that. So uh, look at your rack, think about like, what can I do with one knob? What can I do? What can I send out to uh, multiple things um, to get cool results? I'm going to play us out. My name is Jeremy. This is Red Means Recording. Check the links in the description for a link to my full sets and the upcoming sets or whatever. And also the videos on these two 4MS modules, which have become a very important part of this rec. Uh, thank you for watching. My name is Jeremy. This is Red Means Recording, and I hope you have a wonderful day.